Welcome to Adventures in Consciousness, the interactive show that offers expansive conversation with pioneering new thought teachers and personal real-time guided journeys into the imaginal realm to access your soul's wisdom and discover how to live your greater story. Here is your host, human potentialist, soul mentor, and consciousness guide, Jennifer Ivanko. Hello and welcome. I'm really excited today to be sharing this with you. And I wanted to tell you first about the purpose for these, these shows. Um, I'm hoping to invite you into a beautiful collective field where we can all be inspired to our highest potentials and possibilities. And today's show, I'm, I'm very excited because I think our guest will help take us there. Joining me in the conversation is author, rare book collector, philosopher, researcher, and international lecturer, Stephen Ross. Steve is a guardian and co-finder of the nonprofit World Research Foundation, which houses a phenomenal library with books dating back to 1492. As an author, his books include, And Nothing Happened, But You Can Make It Happen, An Exploration into the Solutions for Our Health Care, and Why These Solutions Have Been Excluded from Common Medical Practice. Another book that I'm in the middle of and very excited about is called A Grand Design of Dreams, Contemplating Divine Revelation. As you will learn today, Stephen Ross's life is full of synchronicities, events, and fortuitous encounters. And maybe even more important today, I hope that he will inspire you with, your, with his stories and his energy so that you can find your own unique soul journey full of synchronicities and flow. Stephen Ross, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate this opportunity to be sharing with your audience. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, one of the things that I've noticed over you know, many years and experiences talking to people is that a curious mind is one of the most important parts of, of these spiritual journeys or these journeys of awareness, not even spiritual, just conscious awareness. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your uh, journey and where it began? Uh, I really have two sources, uh, that would be the best way of expressing it, uh, in my life. One was the health aspect. Uh, I was competing at a national level at my university, sustained a knee injury, was sent to the sports physician for the Rams, Dodgers, and Lakers here in Los Angeles, who said I'd have to have surgery or I could never compete again. I was very dejected. I was in my trainer's room at the University at Northridge, and there was a popular mechanics magazine next to me, it has nothing to do with health. I looked at it, it talked about a technique from Russia. I called Dr. Curlin, who was the sports physician, asked him what he thought. He said, oh no, that's holistic garbage, it will never work. Um, I decided to try it myself missed only five weeks, resumed my training and finished fifth in the United States for 100 meters. It, it placed uh, a question in me. Why did our experts say something didn't work when it did work? And so that began my journey in medicine and alternative medicine. But four years later, I met a Cherokee Indian in Southern California who said, all my future guidance would come in my dreams. And I remember kind of chuckling because I, I didn't recall my dreams at all. But one week later, and it took a week because I was so excited to go to sleep and have a dream <laughs> and I couldn't get to sleep uh, and to the state where I could have dreams. But I finally had a dream. And in that dream, um, and I don't know if we have the time to share it exactly, but I decided to go to what that dream was telling me. And as a result of following through with that dream, uh, after that, I would have five and six dreams a night, every night, regarding my personality, my likes, my philosophical approaches. And then I began having dreams with telephone numbers. Oh. And when I would call those numbers, somebody at the other end would say, we're waiting for you. We have information for you. So since 23, and I am now 72, 
I have been guided by dreams that delivered messages to me. Now, if you and I met at a party and I told you that, you might say, hey, that's interesting. But when you can see this library behind and realize it has come as a result of following through with, with dreams and visions, perhaps you would believe me a little bit more. Yeah, I, I mean, I can understand that a lot of people have that feeling of not being able to remember their dreams, but there's remembering your dreams and then there's believing in your dreams. And it just, what's the difference? Well, it goes back to trust, Jennifer, and uh, I, I'm going to quickly tell you that first dream because I think it'll make more sense for people. Um, in my dream, I heard a voice say, what kind of animal is Steve? And a finger pointed to a, a animal picture in the book. Now, before I tell you what it was, I recognized the voice in the dream. It was a teammate of mine on a volleyball team four years earlier. So I called Bob and I asked him right when I woke that day, Bob, is there anything bothering you? And he goes, no, why are you asking? Something made me ask again. And a third time, and he said, what's your problem? And I don't know why I said, and I was 23, I want to be a better person. And then he said, do you remember our teammate Harold and what you did to him? And I thought, no, I, I don't. And he said, and this again is Bob talking, Harold was the seventh player on our team. We only had six. But when he came in and he made an error on the court, you glared at him. You didn't say anything. You glared. And Bob continued. Harold and I, after the tournaments, would go and have pizza and he would throw up because he couldn't win your approval, and I thought you were a real hog. Mm. The picture in the book was a hog. Now, it was my bed, my dream. Bob had never said anything. I thought we were very close friends. If I had not called, if I had not pursued because of that dream, perhaps things might have gone the same way, perhaps not but I trusted. Now, when people have said to me, Steve, you're different. I go, no, I'm not. Think of what Nike said. I just did it. Something came through in that dream. I trusted something was there. So what you're alluding to, Jennifer, is bigger. It's a matter of do we trust ourselves? Do we give our power just to other people? Or, or can we believe that we have all of that innate knowledge ourselves without having to go outward? And I think that's beautiful. Um, it's interesting because I think sometimes it's spirit finding a way that we can communicate. And for you, it was dreams and then trusting the dreams. Yes. For someone else, it might be synchronicities or signs they see out in nature or but it's just a matter of finding that way for yourself of how to communicate, right? And and that goes again to this, this feeling that there is greater guidance, whether we just want to stop at our over self or higher self or step further and say, oh my gosh, we have spiritual and angelic guidance. It is an understanding that we are good as we are. And we all can tap in directly to the source and source is. And therefore, once we get into that belief, we can accept the animal spirits that cross our path that you're alluding to. And I love it here in Sedona. My wife and I will look out at, at an exact second to see a bobcat walk across our property when we don't maybe see that for five months. And if we hadn't looked, exactly at that five second window, we wouldn't have seen it, but we did see it. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely right. It is the understanding that the messages are all around us. The old alchemist hermetic philosophers believed that the seed of per perfection is in every single thing. That's why in lead, 
the seed of gold was there. That's an analogy for within ourselves, we have the seed of perfection. And our goal in life is working towards that alchemy of becoming that perfect seed. Nothing is going to happen outside can stimulate us, but it's not going to give us that those steps. It's within ourselves and that perfection is there. You know, that brings up uh, what my one of my teachers used to tell me, a process we did called the entelechy. Have you heard that word, entelechy? I, I have not, no. So it was one Aristotle used. In t it's the entelechy of an acorn to be an oak tree. Oh. So it's the entelechy of us to be fully realized in our full potential. And, it, and that will trend into every aspect, every aspect of our lives, our, our being. Um, I wonder, and this has really become very strong in my life, when is enough enough? When do we feel that we are good enough? Because we're, we're kind of in a culture right now where uh, we, we think we have to be better. We don't have enough. There isn't enough money. We don't have enough power. We don't have enough beauty. We don't have enough wisdom. And I believe that's taking us further away from an understanding that we do have enough. We are enough within our, our own selves if we will just proceed along this line of acceptance and belief that we are enough as we are as individuals. You know, that makes me think also of what I experience when I'm with talking with you or some other people who are on their soul path and expressing their own soul beautifully of, of following and serving, that when you are with somebody that is doing theirs, it inspires you to be on your own path more. And I think when we, the, when we try to be something we're not, that's where when, what you're saying is, is so critical. It's like, when is it enough? <laughs> And when I looked at the people who uh, I think really have the goods, they have an incredible sense of humor. They are lighthearted. You, you just feel better when you leave them. And there's something there, if people can understand. Uh, there's a lot of shows out there. There's a lot of teachers and there's a lot of courses and levels and it, it gives people the impression there is so much that they, more that they have to learn to get it all right. And yet, what is enough? And what are people looking for? I decided when we were going to do this show to really pose this question. What and when is enough? People will laugh and say, oh my gosh, these people seeking money, they never have enough. But what about the spiritual seekers? They keep going on and on seeking, but what is the solution? What would really determine for somebody what is enough? Well, I've looked and said, perhaps it's the people who wear life easier. They may go through the same difficulties you and I do, or analogy would be, they may say to you, Jennifer, why is it you and I buy our shoes at the same store, but your feet don't seem to hurt? They're asking, what is your secret that you're going through life and you're handling these situations? You know, the, the evolved, quote, spiritual people, they don't have less challenges and obstacles. They just handle it differently. And that just might be the key. It isn't that some people believe, oh, my gosh, if I'm more spiritual, I'm not going to have the same challenges. Life's going to be easier. Um, they may be in for a surprise because sometimes you accelerate your challenges as you move along. It is, how are we gonna handle it? It's all about the experience, right? And how we yeah. experience, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, embracing the experience and, and laughing at ourselves and observing, right? And, and being in the now and just saying something like this, okay, well, I didn't handle it too well this time. I'm going to do better next time. That 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 is the key. Is yeah. this this improvement? Um, 
nobody hits a home run right away when they pick up a, a baseball bat or achieves anything without a little work. Now, I have to preface that by saying belief systems and our intent are very, very important. If our intent is to be the best type of person, that is a mentality. That is the creation of an environment where you watch what you're doing and who you are. It becomes your philosophy of life. The ancient philosophers who had these titles, Platonists or transcendentalist. It wasn't just a word. It was a lifestyle. Today, people in this fast food time seem to say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm at this. I'm at that. It, it's more than just the words. It is a, a lifestyle. It is a philosophy. If we want to be, quote, good, then you do good things. If you're interested in beauty, you act beautifully. You do things in beauty. It, it isn't rocket science, spirituality. We need to get it back to, to bedrock, which is know thyself, be one with whatever your intent is. You want to be good? You be good. You talk beauty. You walk beauty. You share beauty. If we're going to be loving, that means be loving. In my opinion, all of this is my opinion, of course. Of course. Well, and, and you go back to the essence, I guess, is what you're saying, rather than the words or the outward experience, it's the essence. Words lose their power if the intent isn't there. There is that aspect in the Bible where Jesus sent the disciples out and they had a difficulty with doing a healing when they came back. This is really his admonition. It is the energy, the spirituality behind what you're saying. It's not just throwing out words. I, I wonder today when we talk about people who are wearing crosses and using terminology, are, are they walking the talk? Are, are they acting in the way that their spiritual teacher would have walked. It is a matter of even a lecturer. The, the lecturers who are lecturing like this and they're reading, they're not connecting with their audience. The, their words do not have the power. But we, we can look and say, is it the words or is it the intent behind? Many, many years ago, I read a book of Charles Kellogg who was a great environment, environmentalist in the 20s, who was called the bird whisperer. He could mimic any bird in nature, but he had another gift. He could control fire and flames by different sounds of his voice. And he did an experiment out of San Francisco KGO radio, where at precisely 9 p.m., there was a flame at a fire station 19 miles away, and he was to utter a sound that would make the flame go up, a little later go down, and then go out, which he did perfectly. Well, two weeks after I read the book, I came across the Laplanders in Lapland, and they could control fire singing different melodies. I met a Laplander who demonstrated to me that she could do this. One week after that, I read about the Rafai school of Sufis who could sing and stand in fire. Now, I'm sharing the story for a very important reason. None of the frequencies were the same. None of them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my question is, was it the frequencies or was it their belief? Was it their intent? And so this is a very important key for anybody listening here, it may not be, it's not necessarily the formula. It is your intent, your faith that's going to make something happen. 
And to me, sometimes it's the visceral belief that you have inside that it is going to happen. And your belief comes from that faith and that understanding. And then you can create it and make it happen. Yes, uh, th that is the key. This is why a woman to save her husband or child will lift a car off a person. People will do incredible things, super, quote, human, but not really, just in our parlance. It seems unusual because they are looking at what they want as an end result rather than how to get there. Here, I want to be sharing these keys in this short time with people. Don't look at the how. Look at what you would like to achieve and know that that's going to happen. Let the universe decide how it is going to get you where you want to go because nothing is impossible for those who what? Believe. That's like the, um, the race car driver that's supposed to look where they wanna go and not at the tree they don't wanna hit. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That is very good, that's true. Right. You know, I wanna spend just a couple of moments because that library is behind you and it's so beautiful. And you had a lot of synchronicities to, to create that library as you mentioned in the beginning. Yes. Um, is there one story that is, is more exciting or most fascinating that comes to mind about? Wow, I have 15,000 stories here. But what, what would come to mind is um, one day I had a dream. I was living in Southern California, and the dream was of a bookstore, a real bookstore called the Bodhi Tree Bookstore. Yes. Oh. I, was to, I was to go to the used book section, go to a shelf of books and reach my, ha my hand behind the books and there would be something there. Now, at that time, I was re researching the use of color in healing. Well, I couldn't wait. It was Friday, Saturday morning comes. I jetted down to the Bodhi tree, went to the used bookstore, went to the bookcase, put my hand behind and completely out of sight, was a book, New Light on Therapeutic Energies. I looked at it. First, I was, I was in shock that a book was really there. I opened it up, and there was it said out of print, and there was a price there. And I thought, oh, my gosh, th this must be expensive. But I went to the checkout stand. It was inexpensive. I opened it up, and it had an article about a color practitioner, Dinshaw Gadali, that I was interested in. But two chapters later, talked about something called the Rife Universal Super Microscope from the 1930s. And that stimulated my interest in the super microscope where they discovered frequencies to destroy 60 diseases and illnesses. And within one year of that book, I ended up possessing this universal microscope from the 30s, 1933, that nobody on the internet knows where it was then or where it is now, but it came as a result of that book. Wow. There are 20,000 stories here. Every, every one of these either came through dreams or visions or, or experiences, but, but that was a very big one. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. There's um, something I read that you, you wrote that said, um, going beyond the books we read, uh, nothing is absolutely accurate, but they can stimulate us. And I would say inspire us to our own research. Yes, and it, and it goes back, Jennifer, to our whole conversation of uh, what is reality? What is truth? What is relative truth? What is absolute truth? Basically, in this sphere, uh, Everything is relative truth. It's relative to our perception. It's relative to our upbringing, to our beliefs. But that doesn't make it absolute truth. So we can be stimulated. But we should come to a point where we don't just accept what somebody else has written. It, there was a great philosopher alchemist named Paracelsus in the 1500s. Let no one belong to another who can be his own. 
Now, that is very profound because yes, other people can stimulate us. Other people can get us excited, but that is their experience, their perception. The greatest gift we can have is our own intuition and understanding. And yes, let, let people stimulate us, but not necessarily be our guru or the ultimate because they journey as far as their journey. But that doesn't mean it's yours or mine or anybody in your audience. Uh, the sky, <laughs> literally, it, it's unlimited. And in this day and age, when we have people coming in with really great gifts, there is no telling where they're going to lead us. Hey, this library is filled with the ancients. And I happen to resonate with them because they're truths that have lasted for thousands of years. But what's coming, our world today is different than the world back then. And if we trust ourselves and realize that everybody in your audience is unique and they're gonna come bring things in in their unique way, they're gonna express in their unique way, be open to that. Be open to anything that, that may come because this is how we progress. The seed of perfection is stimulated, not by road and routine, road and routine, doing the same thing over and over. It is from breaking boundaries, from transcending limitations. From infinite creativity, right? From yes. moving into that imaginal realm, which is just beyond fantasy, because fantasy has all that information, like in your library and all that, we just kind of rehash all of what's known. But when you step beyond that, which we uniquely do on our own, into something that's an imaginal, then you come into new possibility. And uh, imagination was considered by the ancient Greeks to be the greatest gift of God. Now, unfortunately, the word imagination has come down to our ear as, oh, it's fantasy. It was just, just someone's imagination. That is false. That is wrong. It's the same thing that happened with the word magic. In the ancient days, magic was an understanding of nature. Unfortunately, some of the religions made it, it's, it's bad, it's horrible. But the same thing happened with the word imagination. With imagination, there is no boundaries. We can transcend everything. Einstein had much to say. With imagination, there, there are no limits. You, you can go to the wherever. And so it's exactly what you're saying. That imagination takes us from being tethered to the earth plane and tethered to our limitations to be unlimited. That's the world I want to live in. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you about your journey, about what your, your synchronicities and your library. Um, I sure hope we can have another conversation again in the future. Absolutely, Jennifer. And again, I want to thank you very much. I'm, I'm always appreciative. Uh, I usually work one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm appreciative of shows when we can share um, information with people. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so Stephen Ross has been um, working with, uh, as I mentioned, the World Research Foundation, which you can find at www.wrf.org, or you can check out his uh, YouTube channel which is less complicated with Dr. Stephen A. Ross. He's got over 80 videos and presentations there. And then of course, lesscomplicated.net for a listing of his books and other philosophical writings. Once again, thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Adventures in Consciousness, The Conversation. I'm Jennifer Ivanko and stay tuned because we're going to have our experiential part of our show coming up next. You might want to have a journal ready because there'll be some writing probably. So for now, go back to break. Thank you again. Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization 
Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. There is no greater mystery in life than you. So why not take a fully experiential plunge into the depths of your being to uncover and retrieve all the secrets and wisdom your soul is crying out for you to know. If you enjoy Adventures in Consciousness, the conversation, you'll love Adventures in Consciousness, the course. Join Jennifer in this unique 13-week series of journeys specifically designed to unlock the mysteries of yourself. Each week, you'll journey progressively deeper into the meta realm where, freed from the limitations of your mind, you'll get to play and explore the inner and outer reaches of your awareness. The next series of Adventures in Consciousness, the course, is starting soon. Find out more and stake your place at jenniferivanko.com. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Welcome back. Um, I'm eager to start with our meditation journey, the experience portion of our show. But I did want to mention real quick, once again, about that curious mind and how powerful it is for us in our own personal journeys to every once in a while step out of our expertise, to step out of that, I know this already, and just for a moment to, um, to be that filled with wonder child. Um, also looking at our senses, We take in the world through our senses. And when we walk around in habit and expertise, we tend to block things down. We tend to not really smell or really taste or really live our our experiences. So I do have an interesting exercise I'd like to demonstrate, but I'm going to wait till after our meditation and see if we have time. So if you have uh, your journal handy, like I said, you might want to take that uh, now, have it ready. And we're ready to begin. So now I invite you to close your eyes and begin to make yourself very comfortable. Relaxing just as fully as you can. And for a little while now, let's bring your awareness to your breath. As you breathe in, and out. Not changing your breath, just being aware of how you breathe in and out. Noticing the air as it passes your nose. And now deepening just a little and notice your chest rise and fall with each breath.
And now let's deepen into those long, slow belly breaths in through the nose. Hold. Out through the mouth. Hold. And continue like this. As you breathe in, imagine breathing a sky blue energy, a sky blue color, filling your body with that prana. And as you breathe out, breathe out tension and stress as if you're breathing out the color gray. Each breath in, a gentle wave of that prana, that sky blue energy. And each breath out, going a little deeper, a little more into that peace and stillness. And as we breathe these deep prana breaths, I invite you to consider those beautiful soul questions. The first, who am I? Who am I? The next soul question, what do I want? The answer may be material, ethereal, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever you would like to see fulfilled in your life. And the last soul question, what is my purpose? How do I serve? Now, take a deep breath in and release, releasing all the questions and any answers that may have come, allowing the universe to work out the details. And continuing with your eyes closed, listening to my voice, be deeply relaxed and listen just upon what I say to you, very fully aware of the words and aware of what you experience when the words are spoken. I invite you now to bring your awareness to your heart center, to that place where your deep desires are, 
and bring to mind something you are facing in your life right now. Some question or challenge can be big or small, could be a project, a relationship, a way of being. And at the same time now, I'd like you to connect to a feeling inside, a sense that something wonderful is about to happen. Imagine like a child, you can delight in the anticipation of finding something new, holding that knowing in your heart, open to the curiosity, to the wonder. And when you have that sensation of quickening, of excitement, of something about to happen, I invite you to bring your hands out in front of you. Physically move your hands out in front of you. And receive into your hands an object, a symbol. This object, whatever it is, has the power to unlock seeded potentials and deep wisdom within you. To be activated, simply explore this object with all of your inner senses. We're going to start with a sense of sight. As vividly as you can, imagine what this symbol, this object, looks like. Allow for any impressions to come to you, exploring the shape, the size, the color. If you have a journal handy, you might even want to write down your impressions. Now imagine touching the object. What do you notice? Is it smooth or rough? Hot or cold? Write down any impressions. Now sound, listen to your object. Do you hear words or music? 
or is there silence? Now smell, what is the aroma that comes to mind as you connect with your object? And now taste. Is there a taste that comes to mind? And now for a moment, observe your feelings about this object and write those down. Very nice. And know that your insights and understandings will continue to grow. Pay attention to synchronicities and to your dreams. And you may want to keep a journal and continue writing your new insights or even drawing this object or the symbols. For now, let's take a deep breath in and release, releasing the object into your energy field and bringing your awareness back to your breath, following your breath now back into your body, into this place and time, and begin to move your fingers and your toes stretching just a little imagining a beautiful warm red energy that flows down over your body bringing such comfort 
and warmth and delighting once again how wonderful it is to have this body as you breathe in and out stretching just a little more and when you're ready slowly opening your eyes and coming back welcome back coming back slowly I'd like to mention um, we started this meditation or in the meditation I asked you to um, bring to mind something that you're facing in your life right now and then we received an object or a symbol encoded within that is all these deep wisdoms that come from your soul from who you are and we process it through our different senses and we tend to very quickly know what it means and then we're done and I invite you to spend some time with what you've written or what you saw or felt or experienced and allow it to unwrap a little bit more um, the information comes to us at a very surface level and then it kind of starts integrating and it becomes we're, we're receiving it on so many different levels and there's patterns and synchronicities that can all be unraveled and opened up and bring you more insight. And then we bring it back to what your, your initial thought was about something you're facing right now. This is your own higher self speaking to you about, uh, ooh, storm just hit, thunder. <laughs> um, it's your own higher self speaking to you. So watch those synchronicities. Um, if you were writing in a journal, you can actually bring your hand and actually touch where you were writing and take a few deep breaths and go back into that space and ask questions. You know, we, we get this information and sometimes you can go a little bit deeper by asking yourself or asking the higher self, what does this mean? What does it mean? And then just write some more or, or draw and maybe turn the object over in your mind and draw the backside of it. Just be curious. These are just all ways to open up to a little bit more, a little deeper. So if you like these journeys, I encourage you to join me tonight. We have a free opportunity to taste um, Adventures in Consciousness, the course. We're gonna be starting a new group soon. And these groups, um, you travel with a collective, a, a group of people that will be doing the same journeys with you for the next few months. And we go through the different levels of self, like the physical realm is where we start looking at not only our extended body, but our energetic body and going even deeper. Tonight is the opening. So we just um, open to the mysteries, all the mystery schools from the past, and from the present, and even from the future, and kind of tap into what's coded inside of you, what we carry from our individual uh, journeys and also from our collective journey. So if you're interested in joining me and uh, some other people who are excited about these journeys, please go to my website at jenniferivanko.com or you can always email me any of your questions or thoughts and that would be at jennifer at jenniferivanko.com. I guess um, I did want to mention I had another uh, little exercise I wanted to share with you about senses and I guess we have a few more minutes I can show you share with you. It's just a little demonstration how we can um, play with memory and um, imagination to activate our perceptions. So if you take a moment now, we'll do this very quickly. If you take a moment and look at an object in your space, it can be any kind of object, small, large, a potted plant, picture, a pattern on the wall, whatever it is, just take a note of it. Okay, so now I'd like you to close your eyes and I want you to fully, as vividly as you can, um, experience these um, sensory experiences as I, I describe them. Just um, vividly bring all your senses into it. We're gonna start with um, imagining that you're standing on a beach and you can feel the sand, wiggle your toes in the sand. 
and then feel the breeze on your cheek. Hear the water lapping. Feel the sun on your face. And take a moment now and move scenes. Imagine your favorite meal laid out in front of you. And actually hear your silverware touching the plate as you take a bite. Imagine the colors, smells, the taste. Actually swallow. See how much you can enjoy that meal just in your imagination. And when you're done, open your eyes again and look at that object and see how it's changed. And I'm going to leave you with that game. You might want to go a little bit deeper, but I'm running out of time. So until next time, next week, have a beautiful day. Mm -hmm.